Good morning, scholars. Welcome back to Asylum. How are you guys doing today? Uh, before I forget, I just did this in the last video, so I'm going to show you guys now. Uh, I made some stuffed pizza skulls yesterday. I made about 18 of them. This is what they look like. I tore it open to get a look inside because uh, on a couple of them, mainly the ones with pepperonis, the cheese didn't melt all the way through. And I'm not sure why, so I'm trying to figure out like the best ratio. And also heating times and temperature. I'm basically experimenting. I did make some brownies though too. And they came out fantastic. Uh, I could have left them in a little bit longer, but well, I say I, my sister's the one that pulled them out of the oven. Uh, but they were soft and gooey in the middle. Uh, so they, they turned out really well. Anyway, anyway, um, I just mentioned it in the last video, but other than that, I'm going to start recording some stuff, uh, a game that my friend Rob told me about, I mentioned it before, uh, I want to try and get some content of it prepared before I start playing, or start uploading for later. So I might start that today, and then maybe get an hour and a half or two uh, things done. And then on my days off, um, do that. Anyway, we'll see where we go from there. We, uh, anywho, we are in chapter 26, page 211. Uh-oh. Dan tore through his desk drawers, searching for the photo of Daniel Crawford. The scratched in eyes, but wait a minute. We're still burned in his mind, but the rest of the details had grown hazy, and he needed to give it a closer look. When he dumped out the entire contents of his drawer onto his bed and the picture still hadn't surfaced, he started to feel a tightening in his chest. No matter how many times he uh, sifted through the pile, he simply couldn't find it. The photo was gone. He had seen the photograph, hadn't he? Yes. Yes, he was absolutely sure. He had even questioned Felix about it, which was how he had learned about the old man in the first place. Maybe Felix had taken the photograph for some reason. Dan couldn't imagine why, but it was better than the alternative. Someone sneaking around in his room, hunting spooky pictures, and then taking them away. He reached under his bed where he had hidden the folder, half expecting it to be gone too. But no, there it was, exactly as he had left it. He wanted to make sure he hadn't missed anything. Uh, last time. Maybe he even put the photo in here without remembering it. He opened the folder. There, right on top of the stack of papers, was a note in now dreadfully familiar handwriting. This one wasn't even in an envelope. In a mad world, only the mad are sane. Then hurled the folder across the room. Papers went flying. I can't take this anymore, he shouted. A moment later, there was a knock on the door, and a guy from the room next to his Thomas stuck his head in. You okay, man? He said. Dan nodded, too upset to say anything coherent. Because, you know, if you have anything you want to talk about, I mean, about Joe and all, they have counselors. Or I could, you know, if you need it. His voice trailed off. No, man, it's really okay. Thanks for asking, Dan said, puffing out his cheeks and what he looked like a smile. Thomas closed the door with a shrug. He used to work with Thomas. He was funny. Dan didn't want help, but he definitely didn't need other people's pity. At dinner, Abby was withdrawn. She slumped in her chair, chewing her nails, and holding a staring contest with her mashed potatoes. Sorry. Dan was still mulling over the little little he knew about his mysterious stalker. While everyone in the cafeteria was noticeably more subdued than usual, Dan felt like all the sadness in the room originated at his table. Finally, Abby spoke. So I was thinking we must be terrible people. I mean, really, really terrible people. I, hmm. That's not what I was thinking, but go on. It's Jordan, Abby said, sliding down even farther in her chair. I feel like we've completely failed him. How? You've been texting him like crazy. He knows we're reaching out. It's not enough. You should go see him. 
We have to get through to him, otherwise we're no better than his family. Or that guy from his school who ditched him. Happy if he wants to be left alone. But he doesn't. We all process stress differently. I think he's hiding. He, like he thinks he's, uh, he'd be a burden or something if he told us what's going on. I want him to know that's not true at all. I know, but I still worry about invading his space. Maybe you should just text him again. Sometimes, Dan, friends have to take a stand and say, Hey, idiot, we're here for you no matter what. I don't like it, Harry Potter. I wish I had friends. What? Anyway. We're not going to disappear when you get grumpy or angry. We're in this for the long haul. We're in this for each other. See, that's why I like you so much, he said, surprising both of them. What do you mean? Nothing. You're right, we should go see him, Dan said. I have figure drawing till 9 o'clock. It seems like such a long time away. Do you think you can go after dinner, and I'll come join you after class? It would mean a lot. Sure, no problem. I'll tell him what you said, although I might leave out the hey idiot part. I hope you don't mind. No, she said with a laugh. That's probably a smart idea. Thanks, Dan. See you later. Dan nodded, waving goodbye as she grabbed her tray and left for class. Okay. Right. He walked out of the commons for a few minutes later, or, or a few minutes later, and followed the well-worn path back to the dorm. Just two more weeks of classes, and they'd all be going home. He wasn't sure how he felt about that. At least Pittsburgh wasn't too far away from New York. Yeah, but it was an easy trip by train. Two police officers still monitored the entrance hall. They were there to provide a peace of mind, but they only made Dan uneasy as if there was something unresolved that the students weren't being told. That is a great point. The tall cop who interviewed Dan nodded to him in greeting as he went by. Dan tried not to read anything into the acknowledgement. Nobody was out and about on Jordan's floor. Dan had noticed that most of the students had chosen to stay outside and away from Brookline as much as possible that day. That only reinforced Dan's feeling that Jordan would be in, since he seemed so determined to avoid human company. I can relate to that. There was no answer when, Jordan, or what, when Dan knocked on Jordan's door. He knocked a little louder and waited, and pressed his ear to the door, wondering if maybe Jordan was in there, but just refusing to answer. But no, he couldn't hear anything inside the room. On a whim, he tried the door knob. The door swung open. No one was inside. The room was freezing. The east side of things looked normal, and a bit messy. But Jordan's uh, uh, half was covered floor to ceiling with torn scraps of yellow legal paper, all filled with his frantic writing. Dan stepped in the room and walked over to one covered wall. He leaned in to take a closer look. This was math on a level he couldn't begin to understand. He wondered if, he, if it even made sense to Jordan. Sorry. The unsolvable problem, he murmured. No! The surface of Jordan's desk had disappeared under a mountain of yellow paper or two laying on top, though, were two photographs that had been printed out on regular computer paper. These photographs, Dan picked them up. They were both shots of Abby, Jordan, and him together. The three of them stood in a row, arms around one another, grinning from ear to ear. When had they taken these? He had no recollection of posing for either one, and that frightened him immediately, immediately no, immensely. He'd never had such big gaps in his memory as these. I do. Almost as troubling as his apparent amnesia was the fact that Dan's face had been X'd out so thoroughly in both pictures that the paper had been torn. What are you doing here? Beep! Dan whirled around, dropping the photographs. You scared me half to death, man. Do you think I care? Hair wet, holding a towel, Jordan had clearly just returned from the shower. He jabbed a finger at the door. Get out! I don't know. Maybe... Wait, Jordan. I just wanted to see if you're okay, that's all. I didn't mean to. Jordan grabbed Dan by the arm and dragged him a few steps. I don't care what you meant to do. Get the beep out. Dan sprinted for the hall, cringing when he heard the door slam shut and bang with a bang behind him. 
he fumbled for his phone, sending a quick text to Abby. It simply, uh, uh, it read simply, Jordan V. Mad. That's the V name. I don't know. That was rage. Real rage. It didn't seem to be the reason for it. But why? What on earth had he done? Why would Jordan hate him so much? Wait. Could Jordan be the stalker? Now that was paranoia. Chapter 27. Uh oh. We have a letter. Dan smelled mint. His office always smelled of mint. The young secretary left a tin of peppermints on his desk every morning and he ate them throughout the day. Julie was like, wait a minute. What's her name? Pretty and young. Too pretty and young to already be working in a place like this. A half-finished report sat on his desk before him. This side of things, the paper-pushing side, always annoyed him. That's what assistants were for. Carnival. But they couldn't be depended upon for anything. Sucking on a mint and adjusting his spectacles, he went back to him, back to the business at hand. Where was he? Ah, yes, writing. Each victim had been strangled, although some had been strang uh, some had struggled. The signs of which were evident in the bruises and cuts they sustained. Reportedly, the victims' clothes to dance looked remarkably convincing, as did those set around the rest of the bar, sitting and standing. Goodness. The planning it must have taken to achieve this. A corpse reaches its peak stiffness at approximately 12 hours after death. To kill the, patron, the patrons of an entire bar and then wait among the dead for hours. I admit even I was skeptical that treatment could help a man so deeply, deeply troubled. Happily, uh, repeated insulin shock treatments. What? And two weeks in the dark room have somewhat improved the patient's temperament. He seems almost docile. I have nearly accomplished something astounding with the man. There will be more sessions, the next one on Thursday, and further monitoring his behavior. Report complete. Beside his name. Daniel Crawford Morgan. He considered the signature and signed it again and again. He wrote his name faster and faster, then flying across the page. Daniel Crawford, Daniel Crawford. The page disappeared in front of his eyes. He could see the dancing corpses. Hear the record uh, wheezing softly in the background. It played the tune of Lucy's music box. And then he was falling down the rabbit hole. Falling. And he woke from his nap with a start. Dan hadn't even known he'd fallen asleep. What was the dream? He concentrated before it faded away. He was seeing again through the warden's eyes, as if they were his own. It felt so real. He even remembered writing the report in the warden's own hand. If he thought hard enough about it, he could taste the peppermints. Ugh. I mean, I love peppermints and all, but that sounds gross for some reason. Dan rolled out of bed, still decided to groggy. On the bedside table, his phone lit up with a picture of Abby. Her text message appeared underneath. Class over, they're handing out ice cream and pod. Uh, want to update on Jordan? Meet me in five. In five? Dang, no time to shower. Dan checked his breath, cupping his palm over his mouth and blowing. It could have been better. He tracked down a beat up old pack of gum in his backpack, but just tasting the mint made him feel sick. What else could Daniel Crawford ruin for him? The lure of ice cream had apparently emptied the dorm, both, stu uh, both the students and the police. At least they're not donuts. My eyes! That actually did hurt. What was that again? Dan jogged through the silent hall to the back stairs. At the second floor, he grabbed the handrail as usual and swung around it to the next set of stairs below. But a dark shape startled him, and he stumbled, nearly colliding with the lump in the stairwell. He dodged it just in time, sliding to the right and grabbing the opposite handrail. At first he assumed it was just a backpack someone had dropped, or maybe a bucket of one of the maintenance, uh, one of the maintenance workers uh, had left. Or maybe a bucket. 
Oh, okay. But no, the shape was bigger and... Oh, no. It was human. There, with one arm on his legs and the other slung over his head, was Jordan's roommate. He... For a second, Dan's limbs refused to cooperate. He couldn't move. Oh, no. He's dead. He's dead, he's dead. He's dead. Oh, jeez. I... I can't... I can't emote. Emotions, even if I'm feeling them, don't come out. It smells like someone's making a pizza. And then knelt, taking E by the shoulders and shaking him gently. What do the safely pamphlets say? Or all they say, don't uh, move someone who's fallen because you might make things worse. No. No, this can't be happening. This isn't happening. Dan whispered, carefully searching along his t-shirt. He pressed his palm to his chest and waited, the hysterical laugh of relief escaping when he felt, a felt the thump of his heartbeat. Ye? Ye, can you hear me? He shook him again. No response. Dan yanked out his cell phone uh, from his pocket and frantically dialed 911. The campus security be better? It'd be closer, that's for sure. Where have those cops gone? Anyway. Yes, hello? I need help. I'm at the Brookline Dormitory on campus. Sorry, I'm Camford. Uh, New Hampshire College. My friend is unconscious. It looks like he was attacked. Or maybe he fell? I don't know. He's breathing, but I can't wake him up. But there's definitely a pulse. The operator insisted he stay on the line, and while it was probably just a moment or two before the police arrived, it felt like a lifetime. He kept his hand on his shoulder, telling him over and over again that it would be okay, that he'd be okay, and that everything was alright. After a while, Dan knew he was babbling, or was tripping out of his mouth as he tried not to panic, when he tried not to uh, notice that one of Yee's ankles, Yee's ankles was neatly crossed over the other leg, as if he had just sat down on the stairs to take the rest. Finally, the police officers arrived. One of them helped Dan up, patted him on the back, and told him to wait downstairs. More cops arrived, and more, and then the paramedics. Dan answered their questions in a daze. No, the stairs weren't slippery. No, he hadn't moved he at all. Yes, he'd called the second he found him. No, he didn't know anyone who uh, would want to hurt you. Uh, they sat him down on a bench in the front hall while the police secured the doors. Nobody from outside was allowed in. And police busted to each floor told the students to, uh, still in their rooms to stay exactly where they were. Through the windows in the entrance hall, Dan could see him trying to figure out what was going on. By the time he thought to look at his phone, he had six after, yeah, he had six missed messages from Abby. Police just freaked out and went inside. Where are you? And Dan, are you okay? What happened? Do you see the cops in there? The messages became increasingly panicked until the final one was just a mess of exclamation points and question marks. Ah, my eyes. I'm fine, he texted back. Found ye, he fell down the stairs or something. Dan glanced up from his phone. The paramedics were carrying Yee on a stretcher. A blanket wrapped tightly over his chest, taking him to the ambulance there. As soon as the paramedics reached the doors, two cops sprang forward to usher them out and controlled the crowd waiting to give a look. The noise that flooded in from the outside was deafening. One mass of shouts and crying, uh, and the blare of ambulance sirens. Uh, what? Abby texted back in a flash. Whoa, poor Yee. I see them taking him to the ambulance now. You holding up okay? Dan was grateful for her concern. Fine, he shot back, even though it was only half true. Because while the police questioned him and paced around and questioned him some more, all Dan could think was that he had looked so still. Still as a sculpture. From their questions, it became clear that the cops didn't feel Joe's murder in the sense of were related. For one, he was still alive, and for another, the apparent murderer was in their custody. But gazing around at the faces of the students outside, Dan knew they were still thinking the same thing. Brookline wasn't safe. Son? Dan's eyes lifted slowly from his cell phone to a police officer standing in front of him. He didn't remember his name, although he knew the officer had introduced himself at some point during the questioning. Dan simply didn't have the energy to remember. You're free to go. The officer said, not leaving to the doors. We want everyone out for now. They asked so that you all gather in the dining hall. Abby was hovering right outside the dorm 
dodging officers who were trying to herd her away. When she caught sight of Dan, she came running. Hey! You... You're really okay? She gave him a big hug. That was nice. That helps. Nobody was doing a very good job of getting people to leave the scene. There was simply too much commotion. Dan looked into the blaze of siren lights, finding that even professors and townsfolk had been roused by the excitement. Clusters of students were, uh, or what, whispered under the trees, and Dan spotted a few familiar faces. Among them, some hall monitors and professors, including Professor Reyes, and... Wait, what the heck? Saddle Weathers' wife. Her gaunt face, uh-oh, was even more ghostly under the blue flashes of the police car lights. Professor Reyes was pushing through the crowd and fly, uh, flagging down an officer. She seemed to be shouting at him, arguing. When Dan tried to spot Sal's wife again, she was gone. They joined the stream of kids going into Wolford. That's all just too awful to think about, Abby said. Do you think he'll be okay? I don't know. I mean, he was breathing, but he was unconscious. It could have been a fall, I don't know. I just hope he's alright. Inside, students seemed around the uh, around Helter Skelter. I don't know what that means. Some of Abby's art friends raced up to them, bombarding Dan with questions. All right, I was there. I found him. Of course, everyone knows. Finally, finally, Abby intercepted, asking them to give him space. Thanks, Dan said to her when they left. I'm not sure I can handle more questions right now. The police already grilled me. The hall monitors had moved uh, the ice cream inside and set it up on the buffet table so students could help themselves. There was also a young woman in a cricket hairnet who was making milkshakes. Look, is this supposed to make us forget? Abby asked, rolling her eyes. But then she spied Jordan standing alone by the windows. She pinched Dan's elbow. Ow, that hurts. Let's get him something. He and he are close. He must be devastated. He wasn't so thrilled to see me when I went to visit, Dan said. In fact, I got the impression he was really ticked off at me. Yeah, I saw your text, she answered quickly. I still think we should say something. Sure, yeah, let's just approach with caution, you know? I don't feel like getting my head bitten off again right now. They waited their turn to grab a shake for Jordan. Dan overheard the kids in the front of, right in front of them discussing their plans to leave. His heart sank. Did this mean the program was over for good? He suspected the only reason things hadn't shut down after Joe's murder was because they'd apprehended a suspect so quickly. But another incident? Well, it was easy to see when people were drawing a connection. Milk shakes at hand, Abby and Dan approached Jordan. His notepads and pen were nowhere in sight. He'd gone back to carrying his uh, many-sided die, turning it in his palm as if he were trying to polish down the corners. Polish? Polish? What did I say? He stared out the windows into the pond, still wearing his blue bathrobe and a pair of brown sweet slippers. When Jordan saw them, he said defiantly, I don't want it. I don't need your pity party. Then we'll go. We'll leave you alone, Abby replied. She put the milkshake on the table next to him, but we wanted you to know that we're here if you need us. She turned to leave, nodding for Dan to follow her. Hang on a second. Jordan took the milkshake, cradling it in both hands. There were big circles under his eyes. His hair was unkempt. The lights from the police officer, uh, the police cars outside, reflected off his face, tinting him red and blue, then ghostly pale. For a moment, Jordan kept his eyes on the cup in his hands. Then he slowly lift his, lifted his head to look at them. Thanks for the milkshake, and thanks. So how are you holding up? Dan asked. Jordan sighed. It doesn't feel real. I mean, maybe he fell, but did you, did you see all those cops? There's no way he just fell. He took a long slurp on the milkshake. What did he do? He's a good guy. A little talk of him, but good. Oh. The program director arrived, informing them in a quavering voice that the dorm had been thoroughly checked and they could now return to their rooms. Nobody seemed eager to leave the dining hall. Come on, Abby said. She put her hand on Jordan's arm. Let's head back to your room. I can walk there myself. Here we go again. Dan braced himself for the blow up. But Abby ignored the tone. I know you can't, stupid. You've got legs, but let's go together anyway. 
Nobody should be alone tonight. And for whatever reason, there's a picture of this. Okay. Well, that turned out rather well, all things considered. Just want to get this one just a little bit shorter. I'd say let's go ahead and read it and make both of them over 30 minutes long, but I don't want to. Okay. So, I'm going to keep working on those pizza skulls and pizza brownies. What? You never. You know what I meant. Brownie skulls. Um, I want to try and make some stuff for the Day of the Dead. Uh, I wonder how you make uh, sugar skulls. Anyway, anyway. If you guys have any suggestions of uh, cool party favors and treats and desserts and stuff that would be cool to make, let me know down in the comments. Um, see what time is it right now? Okay, just tested that. I think I'm going to take a quick shower uh, after I upload these. And then I might try and play uh, that game for a little bit before I get ready for work. And we'll see where I go from there. And uh, depending on how I feel after work, I might record some more tonight afterwards. Uh, hopefully it'll be a fun game. I'm sure it will be. I trust Rob's judgment. I uh, just hope you guys will enjoy it. Uh, my playthroughs of games are never particularly that good. Oh, uh, man. I needed a walkthrough to help me get through uh, Resident Evil. That was a fun game, though. I liked it. Anyway, until next time. Goodbye, everybody. What was I going to say?